Today I'm talking a little bit about DDO5 and uh, some new DFE features on the new DDO5 interface specification. Uh, I tried to explain it. So as you see on the upper right corner, uh, this is a company called I Know How. Uh, so it's a service provider for any kind of signal compliance and measurement uh, tasks that you can utilize. In this case, uh, we are going to three topics, even four topics because there's a backup. Uh, we talk about the invitations for memory interface DFE. We talk about the equalizer that is implemented in the memory. And finally, the conclusion, what does it mean for your design, for your uh, systems? So just looking to DDR5, there are a lot of new features introduced. So we have uh, power reduced voltage, reduced power by reduced voltages. We have a different command address signaling. We have also different use of AD, uh, ODT, the on determination. So all of this stuff is quite uh, new and quite inventive, but uh, you can find all this kind of stuff uh, explained, for example, on the Micron website. So there is a lot of uh, information out of this. But the most important new feature for DDR5 is the DFE equalizer, at least in my personal opinion. So this one is the topic of today's uh, tech talk. And the question is, you might say, oh, a DFE equalizer is something well known in industry. So we deal with uh, equalizers in PCI Express and USB and all kind of high speed interfaces. But there is a significant difference uh, to these uh, serial interfaces on memory interfaces. So just the topology that we have a point to multipoint versus a point to point topology in serial interfaces required a lot of changes in implementing of DFE for simulation, for measurement, uh, and also for design and uh, technology on the DRAM. Also, the signaling was uh, for any kind of equalizer was never intended to be single-ended. It was always intended to be as differential signaling. Even the clocking that we have on serial interfaces we, as with uh, clock and data recovery, with a uh, phase lock loop uh, for clock recovery, is significant different what we have in memory. So we need some source synchronous clocking where we send the DQ and the DQS source synchronous in order to be, uh, be able to capture this one. Another new feature or different feature uh, that we never have seen on serial interfaces is that we now need to take care about read and write and also the read chitter. Because for serial interfaces we have a TX, a transmit line, an RX and all transmit uh, data continuously while on memory interfaces we just have a uh, different timing, DQS to DQ for read versus write, edge versus center aligned. Okay, it's not true anymore, completely true anymore for DDR5. But also the turnaround jitter, because the DRAM is getting a clock signal and all the data which is going to be sent back is relying on the input quality of the input clock. So the signaling direction, unidirectional versus bidirectional is different. We have continuous data stream here on serial interfaces while we have bursted data on memory interfaces and just the asymmetric rise and fall times that we see on memory with the high level termination versus symmetric rise and fall time uh, edges for uh, serial interfaces with the differential signaling will make a lot of trouble for a DFE equalizer. So we have really a lot of new features implemented just for the sake to get a memory interfaces implemented with a decision feedback equalizer. And now you might ask, okay, why a DFE and why not a CTLE, a continuous time uh, linear equalizer? So basically I have here a, shmo a so short simulation where we have uh, just a point to point. So one controller versus one DRAM. And in comparison, I have a point to two point so we have one dim slot and another dim slot. So we have about 10 plus 30 millimeters uh, difference between the uh, two dims. And if we now simulate these two, we get for a one dim per channel a nice linear insertion loss. So basically this is the frequency, this is insertion loss, and this is nicely linear. So this is targeting for a CTLE. So a CTLE can handle this one nicely. But once we have the second dim in here, now we get a very bumpy insertion loss curve. And basically, a CTLE, and CTLE uh, equalizer cannot handle this kind of insertion loss. So that's the reason why we deal with a DFE equalizer. If we take now a closer look to how this one looks in a real system, we have a controller, we have one DRAM, we have uh, one DIM, we have another DIM. In this case, we have a front and back DIM, so two ranks here, two ranks there. 40 millimeters difference, so 10 plus 30, 40 millimeter difference, 
this way. And if you now send a wave, a signal from the controller to the DRAM, it will propagate up to here. And now it will split up. So the real wave that we would like to see, that we would like to receive here at this point, is going up to this dim. And a parasitic wave is still propagating in this direction. And if we follow the path, we are going to send up the signal here. Now we have already received the signal here, but still the wave that is propagating up here is on the way. Even with ODT, even if we terminate this edge here, it's going to be reflected. We will never get a perfect termination. So the wave is getting back, and now it's going down here, going further down, and after a specific amount of time, it's going to be seen here at the receiver where we would like to receive the next edges. And if you do some short calculation, the length for this reflected wave is the 10 millimeters plus 30 millimeters. So up there, up there, and then the same length back. So we have overall 80 millimeters that the reflected wave need to take before it's going to hit our original receiver. With some small rules of thumb, uh, like a speed of 7 picoseconds per millimeter, we are going to end up with a delay of 560 picoseconds. So 550 picoseconds after our initial delay, uh, our initial wave is going to hit us here, we will see the reflection at the same receiver. Calculating this one with a unit interval of 156 picoseconds, we end up that after 3.6 bits, we are going to see the reflection. And the other way around, if we think about a four tap DFE, so four unit intervals can be handled by the DFE, we have four times 156. The DFE can handle a delay of 624 picoseconds. And now we are going to see why this is making the big difference there. Because the easiest way to think about uh, what does the reflection doing is a simple simulation again, again with uh, a step, re in this case, a pulse response through an input uh, resistor here, through an output driver, then some routing to the first dim, some routing to the second dim. We are looking to the signal here, but we get the reflected wave back from here. So this is the intended signal that we have, and this is the reflection when we're going to see it uh, at the first rank. And now I took uh, a grid that is exactly 156 picoseconds. So each of these grid units is representing one unit interval, and so one tap of the DFE. And so you see the reflection is going to hit us between tab 3 and tab 4. So we can nicely compensate this reflection by the DFE. Doing the same simulation now with uh, here 50 millimeters, so we have 80 millimeters up. You see we get the initial uh, peak here, but we get the final reflection back here. But there is no tap anymore. So our DFE, like it is defined in memory, would not be able to compensate this kind of reflection in order to uh, bring the signal down here to a reasonable level or to remove the noise that we're going to see here. So this is the main reason why we deal with the DFE and also with the four taps, which is exactly optimized for a two dim per channel uh, system. If you now take a look to the implementation in the DRAM, you're going to see this kind of pictures, we have a DQ line with an interconnect and basically here we have this DFE circuit. As you see here on the DQS circuit, we don't have a DFE. So this one is just given the timing information when does a bit arrive to allow the DFE for the DQ interface. A little bit more detailed, you're going to see this kind of stuff. So you have some kind of delay and then the signal here from the DQS will trigger the slicer to bring in the feedback of tab 1, the second bit will bring in the signal uh, from tab 2, and so on. So looking to this pulse response again, what we are going to see here is that the first bit after the pulse response most likely is too high. So the decision feedback equalizer need to bring this one down here to the zero volt level. The second might be too low or too high, and overall we have five bits that we can compensate and shift in level basically to ensure that we can reduce the noise. And if you're not familiar with DFE equalizers, you might have seen this kind of data I already, where you have a boundary condition here and a boundary condition there. So this is what a DFE equalizer does. The DFE equalizer just shifts the waveform a little bit up or a little bit down, and in simulation here, or also in measurement, the eye will look like it's having a strange border on both sides of the unit interval. 
And now this is what the memory allows us to program. So we have a lot of uh, mode registers that allows us to enable and disable the DFE. So we can enable it globally by writing a mode register. We can enable the different tabs there. We have uh, bias, uh, gain bias, so we can also adjust the bias and also positive or negative. And last but not least, we have all these tabs, tab 1, 2, 3, and 4, for all the DQ lines inside the DRAM. And now what you see, what the DRAM is allowing, we can allow here the bias max with 50 millivolt, so we can shift up the, the waveform with 50 volt up, millivolt up, or we can configure this one with minus 200 millivolt. So the first bit allows a wide range of adjustment there. The other bits that are coming later on uh, do have less adjustments, but this is basically what the controller need to figure out in training. So what is the best setting for all of these bits? And then the controller need to write a mode register in order to make sure that uh, the DFE does its job correctly. And now, at that, so that you see that it's not only a simulation or whatever artifact, some measurements. So in this case, we have a DIM. So this is a micron DIM with an interposer in mounted in here. So here you see the setup. So this is the interposer. Uh, the DIMP is the interposer with the probe soldered. And also to allow you a closer look up here, you see the probe soldering here. So this is the interposer with all the pads, with all the signals where you can connect uh, to the signals. And the measurement on this one is just looking like this. On the left side, you see a nice data eye. So even uh, center aligned, which is not uh, absolutely required, but the data eye opening is quite nice. Uh, so this is the DQS, and the DQ line is having a nice data eye. But this is a one DIM per channel. So this is really a point-to-point -point connection. If you now take a look to the right picture, you see that uh, the opening here is quite small. And if you now take a closer look in here to this one, you see, OK, there is still a small opening, but looking to the wave shape here, you see a single one is very low. And once you get a double one, then it's much higher. And this is exactly the, comp uh, the effect that the DFE should compensate. And with the DFE, you could open this kind of data eye in a way that the DRAM is able to receive a 0 or a 1. By the way, the system is running at uh, 4.8 gigabit per second with two DIMMs per channel. Just single rank, but still uh, the full frequency range. So the conclusion to this one is basically for a one DIM per channel, if you implement a one DIM per channel, the DFE will help you to compensate the losses. That's for sure. But it might not be absolutely required. If you're going to a two DIM per channel implementation, the DFE definitely is a feature that you need to implement and you need to take care in your design. So the question of my customers is usually, can we design a DDR5 me uh, memory, for example, with uh, just based on design guides? So Intel, AMD, whatever controller vendor is providing design guides. And personally, I think, yes, it's still possible to implement a DDR5 based on design guides. But if you would like to be better or faster than the competition, so for example, running uh, at a higher speed grade, then you need to really take care about this kind of feature, doing the simulation, doing the measurement, and make sure that the controller can optimize the decision feedback uh, equalizer nicely. And as you have seen also before, not just the stop lengths, but also if you change the speed, then the reflection will you hit, a different, hit you at a different point in time. So speed lengths and reflection lengths is always a combination of both when the, uh, how the equalizer need to be configured. And the last comment that I would like to make here is that verification measurement, like I have done before, uh, for such a DDR5 memory is difficult. So for a one DIM per channel, in this case, I did not even de-embed the interposer and I had no equalizer. For a two DIM per channel, you are going to de-embed the, de -embed the interposer and also utilize a DFE equalizer inside the scope to reproduce what the DRAM is going to do. So this is basically what I wanted to tell. So just to make you aware that this new feature is definitely design, layout, and verification relevant, and you need to take care that you understand what's going on inside the DRAM.